Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. <laughs> My name is uh, uh, Pedro Reyes, and I have the honor of serving as the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at UT System. And uh, as we begin uh, this afternoon, I'd like to recognize some, some folks who are here from, uh, from System. Uh, and, and I'm looking for our regent. Is, is he here? Not yet? All right. Uh, so Regent Aliceda is going to, is, will be here in, uh, I think, in a few minutes, Ernie Aliceda. Um, uh, obviously, he represents the Valley, and, and he represents the Valley really, really well. I was in executive session with him yesterday. So <laughs> um, I'd like to also introduce uh, um, uh, Dr. Julio Leon. Uh, Julio, if you could just stand up and say hello. <clears throat> Julio. Julio has been working with us and, uh, and planning, uh, doing the first uh, phase of planning for this new institution, and, and uh, he's been very helpful, and I want to thank you, Julio, publicly. Uh, Dr. Francisco Fernandez, the Dean of the Medical School. Thank you for being here, uh, Frank. Uh, I was, I was telling the, uh, Dr. Bailey that when he was here, he was being introduced to the whole community. We had three Franciscos, Francisco Cigarro, Francisco Scarano, who was the dean of the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, and Francisco Fernandez. So it became the three Franciscos and, and Ray. <laughs> so, and he's having a great time. He's, he's been here, I think, two weeks, Frank, two weeks. and. Uh, he just told me about some really wonderful restaurants that are right here. <laughs> and I'm from here, How's, how about that? I mean, <laughs> well, when you're at mom's house, why would you want to go to a restaurant, right? Um, uh, Barry, are you here? Where's Barry? Barry McBee. He's a, a vice chancellor uh, as well, and, and Jenny, Jenny Lacoste. Jenny, uh, she works with us making sure that um, we say the right things to the to the public. <clears throat> so, uh, we um, uh, I, I was telling the faculty that we we have the great privilege of being witnesses to a an incredible time, transformational time in in in, in this great area of the Rio Grande Valley. Um, if you think about this, uh, what we've been trying to do here, it was 18 months ago. 18 months ago. Only 18 months ago, when we, when we uh, talk about, talked about establishing a new university in, in, in this area. And uh, I want to thank all the legislators for helping us get, to, to get there. And that vision now is becoming a reality. Um, and obviously, with the support of all of you, all the staff, all the faculty, all the students um, and, and also the business and the, uh, <coughs> the, um, the community leaders. And so to, today, um, I want to introduce to you uh, the uh, um, sole finalist for the presidency of UTRGV, and it's uh, Dr. Guy Bailey. Uh, Dr. Bailey brings a wide range of experience um, that I think will serve uh, not I think, I affirm that will serve the students of the Rio Grande Valley really well. Uh, he's a social linguist, uh, social linguist uh, uh, and uh, I think being a social linguist, a humanist will complement really nicely the medical school. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in, in English from the uh, University of Alabama and a doctorate for in, in linguistics, English linguistics from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he completed postdoctoral uh, studies at Emory University as well as at Stanford University, and he's uh, incredibly well published. Uh, Dr. Bailey, uh, as I said, is a seasoned uh, university leader and returns to the system now. Um, I think some of you know that he was provost and executive vice president at the University of Texas San Antonio, and I happened to work with him uh, maybe eight or nine years uh, guy. I was at System, and, and he was uh, provost at uh, UTSA, 
and he did an incredible job at, when he was at, um, at UTSA by moving UTSA where, where it is at this point in time. He was also chancellor of the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he led the medical school, the pharmacy school, the dental school, and, and uh, humanity school, and the school of music, and all of the schools. And the law school, Terry's telling me that the law school as well. How can you forget lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> we love lawyers. <laughs> I do, <knew> Terry. <laughs> they keep me out of trouble. Uh, uh, and he was also the president of Texas Tech, and he did an amazing job there at Texas Tech uh, as president. Uh, uh, an incredible, uh, he built an incredible um, relationship with the community, uh, not only the community, but the faculty, the staff, uh, and I think you will hear from him about uh, his views about staff. And he was also the president of, at the University of Alabama, uh, his um, alma mater. And so um, he is um, uh, quite experienced uh, in, do, in, in managing large, complex academic uh, enterprises. And all of those attributes, all of those experiences, he brings them to, to this place. And uh, uh, because what we're about to do is more complex than just taking one institution and moving it uh, forward. So Dr. Bailey is really committed to undergraduate education. He's not only committed to uh, undergraduate education, he's a vocal advocate for students. And I think he has a, a policy that uh, any student could walk in into his office and have a hearing at any point in time. And not necessarily all the presidents do that. Uh, he also has done a lot of work with the community. When he was in San Antonio, he, uh, he established uh, the, uh, the first uh, couple of college um, uh, high schools, what is it, early college high schools in the community with uh, low income um, areas in, in, uh, in, in UT and in, in San Antonio. And then in Missouri, uh, he oversaw an innovative approach to medical education where students were granted admission to the medical school since high school. And so he brings some of that, those experiences uh, to us. So um, um, uh, the, I want to thank Liana for, being, uh, for serving on, on, on the, on the uh, uh, search committee uh, because again, he, he, we saw this incredible resource that could help us bring this, uh, this uh, a new institution to fruition, and I think we're expecting great things from Dr. Kai Bailey. So please help me welcome him, and he'll address. Thank you. I think I did that last session too. <clears throat> My apologies. If you don't mind, I'd prefer to stand down here. <clears throat> a little bit easier on me, and uh, uh, anyway, if, uh, if you can't see or you need me to go up there, I will, but if, if it'll work down here, let's, let's try that. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you how honored I am to be here today. Secondly, I want to thank all of you for showing up. Wow, this is quite a crowd, and uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, I don't know that I've ever drawn this large a crowd before, <laughs> so something important must be happening. It, <clears throat> it's really quite an honor, and together uh, we have one of the great honors uh, uh, that we'll ever have in our lifetime. If you think about what's happening now, we're establishing the first major university of the 21st century. Think about that. <clears throat> what's happening here is unique. It's the first, and it'll have wide ramifications. Uh, you know, I, I was a dean at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And you know what they say, what happens in Vegas? Yeah. <clears throat> but what happens here if we do it right? We'll go all over the world, all over the country. I mean, we'll be setting a pattern for a lot of things that's going to happen. You think about that. That, that is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous honor. And uh, so <clears throat> all of us ought to be proud of what we're embarking on. Now, having said that, it's not going to be easy. I mean, there are plenty of challenges, and you're going to ask me about some of them, and, and that's what we're here for today. <clears throat> but the truth is, I think when everything is said and done, you'll be very proud of what we've done, and this is something we'll do together. 
It, it can't happen without your help. <clears throat> I like to make a point when I talk to staff. Presidents come and go. Faculty come and go. Students, you hope they're here four years and graduate. <laughs> maybe, maybe some over here more, but you know, the, they, they do eventually come and go. The people who are here for the long haul are the staff. And I won't ask you to raise your hands, but if I ask you how many people have been here 30 years, I'll bet you a bunch of hands would go up. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, if, if, if you look at the continuity, I won't ask about 40 years. The, the, <laughs> the real continuity in an institution is the staff. I mean, that's the thing that doesn't change much from year to year and, and it carries o over. So having been a president and a provost, I have a deep understanding for the role that uh, that staff play. <clears throat> As we m move forward, there are really <clears throat> two imperatives we always have to keep in mind. Th the only success of an institution is really the success of its students. We, we have no success apart from their success. Does that make sense? Uh, you, you think of Harvard as a great university because of what its students have done, right? <clears throat> and so as we build an institution, we have to keep in mind that the success of our students first and foremost, okay? And if we do the valley very well, okay? The, the other thing we want to keep in mind, this is an opportunity for this institution to move into <clears throat> the emerging research category. It's going to take a little time to do it, but it's doable. And as that happens, there, a, a number of opportunities will open up across campus for everybody. So. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are two important imperatives there. Uh, in any event, as, as, as we move forward, we'll keep those things in mind. And uh, uh, as I said, I think this is the opportunity of a lifetime for, uh, for all of us. Uh, now, I'll throw this open to questions, and anybody is welcome to come up and ask questions. That's probably the best way to proceed. So there's a mic there. Don't be shy. Faculty weren't shy. <coughs> you shouldn't be either. Is the president of the staff senate here? Yeah. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, welcome, Dr. Bailey. Hello. Can you guys hear me? All right. Welcome. Thank you. Um, speaking of the widespread, the different campuses that we're going to have, the, the <coughs> bigger geographical location that we're going to have now. Uh, technology and especially distance education is going to play a critical role. So um, being passionate and very interested about distance education, I would like to know what your thoughts are, your philosophy or, or your vision with regards to online education, distance education for this new university. Well, <clears throat> as you said, it is going to play a crucial role. And by the way, I think there are a bunch of private partners out there waiting to jump in and help us make that happen. I, I think there are a lot of people <clears throat> sitting out there who think that this can set the pattern for how distance education is used. I mean, one, one experience with distance education <clears throat> that I think illustrates a, 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 just a slightly different take on it. When I, when I was a provost at UTSA, I taught a, a couple of courses a year. I teach in the summer and then one course during the, the regular academic year. And I usually taught history of the English language. That's the English major's least favorite course, right? And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to teach both downtown and on 1604 campus. So what I did was, was simply, uh, uh, you know, we had the class video streamed. I'd teach sometimes downtown, sometimes 1604. <clears throat> video stream it. You get questions that way. And so it, it went pretty well. I, I could get significantly more students that way and, and you know it, it enabled us to teach that class two places and we couldn't have done it any other way. Something else happened that really amazed me while this was going on. Uh, the, uh, the Dean of the
Is this one cut off? Okay. Anyway, the, the, the two things there, how do we expand the scope? Uh, how do we reach more students? But how do we help our students be more successful? If we can do those two things, we will have used technology, I think, to its fullest. So. Dr. Bailey, I have a question. Um, as you can see, it's standing room only in here, and I hope it was like that in Brownsville, but can you give us maybe some of your um, things that have worked in the past that have helped to <coughs> unify staff between campuses? Obviously, distance is, is a challenge here, um, and we have campuses in McAllen. There'll probably be campuses in Harlingen and in, even in Rio Grande City. Uh, maybe some things, I mean, people here like to see the president out and about, and uh, maybe give your thoughts. Um, I know you're not official yet, but obviously, hopefully it's something you've thought about. Yeah, that, that's a good question. You, you will see me out and about, and uh, <clears throat> the, the it, I, I have to tell you, and I, I told this the faculty, this is a true story. Uh, I, I bought a brand new pickup truck. I figure that thing, will, if I can get three years out of it, I'm going to be lucky because I'm going to be driving up and down the, the valley uh, over and over again. And uh, so, so you will see quite a, quite a bit of me. There, there are two things I think you have to do uh, to help faculty feel unified and part of it. First of all, we need to figure out ways for you to interact with folks in Brownsville and, and the other campuses. And you're right, this will be distributed all over the valley. And so we want at least some mechanism for interaction, whether it's uh, uh, you know, uh, by teleconference, some of it will be. <clears throat> the other thing, we'll try to do things uh, that show that our appreciation. And I'm sure you've got things like staff awards and so forth. but. Uh, one of the things that my late wife and I always did, we had a, a Christmas event on campus, and it was for everybody. It was for faculty and staff, and we went there. And, and so it was a chance for the entire campus to kind of come together. We'll look for ways to do things like that. <clears throat> At the beginning of uh, the school year, uh, I usually was able to get our food, and did this both in Kansas City and, uh, and at Texas Tech, got our food service provider to provide free hot dogs and Cokes. And so uh, my, all the vice presidents and I had to go out and serve students and so, uh, and staff as well. And so, we, you know, we, we basically served hot, it was a way to get to meet people and, and to get to know people. So y you'll see me around and, and, and we'll do things like that, that try to help you get to know me a, a little bit. And you'll find I'm pretty low key and down to earth. I'm not, uh, so anyway. My wife was even, my late wife was even more so, and any time I sort of got a, the least bit away from that, she put me in my place, so. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? This is your big chance. Faculty weren't shy, so you gotta, you have to ask questions. Yes. Are you <clears throat> um, there's some anxiety um, amongst the staff regarding the, called the new structure and possibly some reorganization. Um, can you provide any information to ease some of that anxiety regarding time frames or processes? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll do the best I can here. <clears throat> it's interesting, the, the structure of the univer new university isn't fully determined. Remember, I'm not even official yet. <clears throat> so as we go forward, we'll look at how this university ought to be put together, how it ought to be structured. There are a couple things you ought to keep in mind. <clears throat> the new university is going to, when it starts, it'll be at least as large as UT Brownsville and UT Pan American. And so we're, we're going to need a lot of folks to help make that happen. Think about it. it, it th th this was not... this. Uh, uh, change was not done as a cost savings measure. So we're gonna, there will be a lot of opportunities there. The second thing, as the new university structure is put together, th there will be many more opportunities for employment than unemployment. We're gonna need people. The workforce for the new university is sitting in a room here. Think about it, where, where else would it come from? A and, and so <clears throat> as we put together a more complex university, I think 
and, and this is a hard thing to see right now, over time, your opportunities are going to be better and better. Your, your opportunities for advancement and for doing things are really going to be greater than they are now in a more complex university. Does that mean that everybody's going to be in exactly the same role that they are right now? No, not necessarily, but we're sensitive to people's, I understand that this is how you feed your family, I, you know, so uh, we're very sensitive to all of those things. <clears throat> and I think what you'll find out as we move forward as an institution, the chances for development and advancement are probably greater in the new university than they would be in the old. Does that, that make any sense at all? Think about it. The workforce for putting together a university is sitting here, is sitting in Brownsville, it's, you know, in Harlingen, wh wherever. <clears throat> this is the talent in the valley that, that can get things done. So our job is to figure out how to best use that, how to make sure that people are in the right places to help us accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So the, the issue is, is not to come in and, you know, it's not really a, 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 this was not a cost savings proposal. This is a proposal to create something uh, really dynamic that would drive the whole valley forward. Other questions? I'll bring you the mic. <laughs> so, you want Okay, so there's no crickets in the room. Uh, see, I'm short. I have to. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, well, since you talked to the faculty at the previous session and the staff at this session, uh, we've talked a good deal at both sessions about the distance between here and Brownsville. But I was wondering if you could address the issue of um, better uniting the faculty and the staff so that the two different groups have a better sense of what each other are doing. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good question. <clears throat> you know, first of all, I think the simple fact of putting together a, a common team will help do things. So right now, for example, there are two financial aid offices, right? <clears throat> but as the financial aid offices are merged together and as you have a common goal and are working toward a common institution, now you're going to have to use a lot of, uh, uh, you know, telecommunication type things. There will be some face-to-face -face things. But as you do that, I think you'll become a team as you start working toward one goal on one Does that make sense? On one project. Right now, you're two institutions. Why, why should you be, you know, have... Uh, uh, but once you're one institution with a common goal and you're one financial aid office and, <clears throat> and one advising system, and I think uh, and we have a, a common set of goals and aspirations, I think that as much as anything will we'll help and, and we want to make sure you have we have equity uh, among the campuses that, that there is you know and so th those are things that that I'll pay careful attention to in going forward and uh, again all of us administratively will have to uh, that won't ever be something we can take for granted so it'll always be something we'll work on but but I think a common goal common set of uh, of aspirations and things that you have to do will help as much as anything once you start working together. So right now you don't work together, so why would you? Yes. Thank you. Um, I really liked about your analogy about what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and you did mention that's not going to happen here, which I love it. What are some of the things you have in mind when you say that the great things will happen here? Well, thank you. I, I think organizing a university around the success of students, <clears throat> if you think about it, uh, over you know, the several hundred years of universities in the United States, when we put them together, what we, the first thing we, the thing that we don't think about first is the success of students. It, go back and look at when the last universities were s set up in the state of Texas. What, 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 I mean, was that the first thing that was said? And so, actually, the, the last universities set up in Texas were probably UTSA and UT Dallas, weren't they? Yeah. <clears throat> and I'll bet you, if you go back and look at the founding documents, that, that's not there. The, the other thing, remember that, that our importance to the valley and the valley's importance to us is much greater 
I mean, that the, the relationship is far more important than it is in most places. I, I taught one time at Emory, had a postdoc there and then taught for a while. You could have put Emory on the moon and it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, it didn't matter that it was in Atlanta. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter that Harvard is in Boston. That's, that's irrelevant. But it matters that we're here. And so <clears throat> as we you know, continue and become even more engaged, I, I think that will be very important as well. As we develop new degree programs and as we do things like that and look at different ways of, of organizing those, I think we'll set a pattern for, for going forward. So those are a few of the things. You mentioned that um, the proximity or, or the fact that UTRGV is located here in the valley is, is very, very important to the people of the valley, more so than, say, in Boston or other areas. In our role as an emerging research institution, where do you see those of us that work in developmental ed and pre-college access in preparing high school students and students to be successful once they get to college. As an emerging research institution, I see our standards have to go up. How will we address and help to provide assistance for those students who may not meet those new standards? That, that's an excellent question, too. You know, <clears throat> here, here's the interesting thing. That same problem ha has something I've had to deal with in a couple of different places. And uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons we started early college high schools in San Antonio is that we didn't think we were getting enough students from certain parts of the city, and the students we were getting were not well enough prepared. Y you have to be engaged with the public school systems. Uh, and, and, so, and, and you're, you're doing some of that already, but, but that has to be a major focus of the institution. How do we work with the public schools to en enhance that? At, in Kansas City, we had the same issue. We had some partnerships with the Urban League to, for uh, student preparation. You know, it's interesting. If you look at remedial education, which you don't really do, but many students get out of high school having needing remedial work. Well, the time to have done that was in high school, right? There's no reason we can't work with the public schools <clears throat> to help remove to move remediation back to, to when kids are in school. That's the time <clears throat> they really need the help. So we'll look for creative ways to work with the public schools. The other thing, the community colleges, <clears throat> I can't stress how important they are. At Texas Tech, we, we had this issue too. We had a lot of kids who wanted to go to Tech who just really couldn't quite get in. And so I, I, Dr. Juan Munoz was... Uh, helped there with student success, one of my vice presidents, and I said, look, I wonder if we could set up a partnership with South Plains College here where <clears throat> kids could be admitted to South Plains, they could come to Tech, they could live on campus, they could participate in everything that people did at Tech, they'd go to the football games, do everything. <clears throat> but they, they had one semester in which the classes were taught by South Plains, and if they met certain requirements, they could transfer over. That's one of the most successful programs. I can't, uh, you know, Juan did it. So it, it, I really like that program. It helps. And there are a lot of students who uh, maybe the, the, the SAT wasn't very good or, you know, they hadn't done all that well senior year in high school and, or something, but they had the potential. And this gave those kids a chance to do it. It's actually the fastest growing program at, uh, at Texas Tech now. <clears throat> there, there'll be creative things like that, and you'll have some of the ideas. And, I'm, I'm always uh, anxious to hear them, but, but you're exactly right. We, we can't simply open the doors. We have to go outside the doors, and we're going to have to help uh, outside the university. Here comes the question. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Firstly, I'd like to welcome you to the Great Grand Valley. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's gonna Thank be you. A lot of fun. All the buildings going up, you know, in front of us, behind us, they've already knocked down the school to build the, the new medical school. 
I'm from the chemistry department, and we're all hoping. When, you know, do you have any idea when the new chemistry building or the new science building's going up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we need the space. We're packed in there. You, you know, well, for, first of all, an architectural firm has already contacted me, and I'm not even official. <laughs> so, well, I thought maybe you would heard or something because no one's got as know. fast as possible. You know, the the facility. One point I want to make. The, the other thing that you phrase that you can, you know, we've heard, put your money where your mouth is. The UT system has really done that. $350 million investment in the new institute. It's, it's incredible. You know, at UTSA, what we would have given for half of that is just an absolutely incredible investment. <clears throat> so these, those things will go up fast, and, and as they do, remember the, the new medical school will be a huge impetus for a number of things. First of all, it'll help us leverage uh, you know, some strengths at the general academic level and, and build research. That, so that's one thing that's really important there. The new medical school will be the best recruiting tool for undergraduates. Right. I, I mean, they'll think about this. You can start school right here, and you can go to medical school. You can do your residency, <clears throat> and you can stay right here, and that's, that's what's oh, needed in the valley. But the facilities are really part of it, and we'll move them forward as, as quickly as we can. So, well, yeah, once I get a official, I can respond better. But, yeah. That is true. Our architect, architectural firms have already they, but People around the country, by the way, understand what a big opportunity this is. And you'd be surprised at the amount of national interest in what's going on right now. So, yeah. <clears throat> I work in the, welcome to the Valley, Dr. Bailey. I work in the marketing office for the university. And one of the questions that I'm asked uh, by different uh, media vendors and, and providers all over the country is, are we going to outreach to the rest of the country about this new university? Number one, to bring some diversity here and also to offer opportunities to people not necessarily from the Valley, but that would like to come to school here as well. Well, we, we probably will. It's interesting. <clears throat> it, 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 let me tell a little story, and then I'll try to answer that question more directly. When I was at Texas Tech, and I started looking around the state of Texas at where we got students and where I thought there were great opportunities, right down here, here in the valley. And so Texas Tech, we, we did recruiting events here when I was at Tech. <clears throat> I came in person because, y you know, it takes a lot of recruiting to get a student to drive from McAllen to, or fly from McAllen to Lubbock. That's not an easy trek. <clears throat> but we, we actually did a pretty good job of doing that. I, I think as this institution, it, as it becomes innovative and people become aware of that, <clears throat> there'll be a lot of interest out, outside the institution. And yes, we, we can do some recruiting. We wanna serve, you, you know, you, you serve your, the place you're in first. And then you look outside, and so there will be lots, lots of opportunities to do that. I'll give you one example. We set up an institute for urban education at Missouri, Kansas City. <clears throat> we intended this <clears throat> to serve students in inner city Kansas City schools. And what we were doing, we give them full fellowships, and <clears throat> they would come live on campus, uh, study, get their degrees, and then go teach in Kansas City schools. Well. After about two or three years, when the program kind of got a little national reputation, we had students from all over the country applying for that. <clears throat> I, th I think what will happen here as things become innovative and we do some things differently, you'll have a lot of interest and we'll be able to recruit uh, uh, pretty broadly. So, and remember, we can, re we, can re we can recruit both sides of the border too. So but we have some advantages that other people don't. Other questions? <coughs> yes. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so I'm part of the development team here on campus, and um, so it's a <laughs> busy, busy job. Uh, we, um, as a development team, we have some great partnerships um, and with external funders. Of course, it's a challenging time, a challenging world. The chancellor many times has said the importance of philanthropy. What are your thoughts or vision moving forward and working with external partners? Well, that's great. I, <clears throat> I, I have to tell you a real quick story here. 
when I took over as chancellor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, <clears throat> they were in the midst of a capital campaign. The campaign had been announced with great fanfare. It was $250 million capital campaign, I think. <clears throat> there had been all the, the leading lights of the city there, all the wealth in the city. The chancellor had gotten up and announced this. The next morning, she was fired. That's not the way to begin a capital campaign. <laughs> so I inherited that. You know, the, the truth is we finished that thing in about a year. Uh, <clears throat> the city was very supportive there. It's absolutely crucial. If you think about it, the financial aid for students, I mean, Texas grants, you know, I mean, Texas is pretty good at, you know, the, the Texas grants, be on time. You've got uh, a number of federal programs, but the truth is scholarship money is often the difference in keeping your best students here and they're going to uh, Stanford or Notre Dame. <clears throat> Raising private money is important there. And so, uh, you know, you and I will be best friends in doing that because uh, uh, we'll, we'll want to really uh, uh, push that uh, pretty dramatically going forward. So it's, it's absolutely crucial. One of my, uh, someone I know who is a former dean here uh, wrote a note and congratulated me. His daughter is now a doctor and she's a graduate of, uh, of Pan Am and I said, well, just tell your daughter I'll be asking her for money here before too long. <laughs> so, you know, and that's true. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the truth is we, we want to work carefully and cultivate partnerships all across the uh, all across the valley the 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 good thing about the valley uh yeah, some of you know the work of steve murdoch who's a good friend and steve and i've already talked he, t he told me that the wealth in the valley is in he said I, I used to come down and do presentations and i have to say well the valley's still he said valley's starting to catch up he said that, that wealth is building in the valley and that's a good thing and we need to be aware of that and as we go forward. But you probably can tell me more about that. So, yeah. Questions? I'll bring you the, I'll bring you the mic. My name is Debbie Grant, and I'm with Alumni Relations. And I love, we have a... Of course, we've got two schools. Right. We've got alumni from two schools. I want to see your idea of how to forge the two together. We want to make sure they work together. And I just would like to see what your ideas are on that. Oh, th that's a great question. By the way, <clears throat> anytime you have an alumni event, I'm happy to come and when I was at Texas Tech, one of the things I learned, <clears throat> you go to all, every alumni event you can, doesn't matter whether it's in Tuya or Slayton, or New Deal, you go, and, and so I, I've sp spoken at all those places. <laughs> you may not know where they are, they're small, but <clears throat> the truth is everywhere there is a group of our alums, we want to work with them. It, one of the ways that I've asked alums to, to work is, is help in recruiting. So when we set up Texas Tech recruiting events in the Valley, we had our alums, and there are a lot of Tech alums down here, <clears throat> we had them come and meet and work, help us work the room. I'll do the same thing. One way to get, uh, you know, UT Brownsville and, and UT Pan Am alums together, have them working together on the same projects. And so we'll try to figure out things like recruiting and other projects where, where they're part of teams. And just as when you become all one team, you'll work together, same thing will happen with the alums. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to, to always be cognizant of traditions that have, you know, and, and help be, be cognizant of that when we work with alumni. But they'll be, real, they'll be crucial to what happens going forward. And also for that fundraising too. Is that it? But I wanna thank you <clears throat> for your hospitality and for showing up. I really appreciate uh, the, the welcome. Uh, I look forward to working with you. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you it's going to be an easy job, but I think it's going to be a fun job, and I think when we get to the end, we'll all be really proud of what we've accomplished. So thank you very much.